Hello everyone and welcome to my talk. I am Giorgio Guer. I am the Director of Artificial Intelligence from the Scripps Research Translational Institute. And I'm here today to talk to, to, to discuss with you about artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence can be used to analyze and interpret uh, data from wearable sensors uh, with the goal of improving human health. We start really with the uh, concept of digital medicine. Digital medicine is about using digital tools, uh, like you see uh, uh, from the figures here, a smartwatch or potentially a patch attached to your uh, chest. Um, this tool are incredible as they can uh, passively monitor an individual, so without the individual to do really anything, uh, for a really long period of time. Um, they can be used to monitor these individuals, uh, not just for a few minutes as uh, potentially inside a hospital, but really for weeks, months, or potentially up to a lifespan. They work like this, they are basically connected to your uh, smartphone, they send the data to your smartphone and the data is then uploaded to the cloud where it can be analyzed potentially in real time uh, by researchers like, uh, like us. Now, how do we analyze this data? Well, uh, here artificial intelligence play a big role. Artificial intelligence uh, has already been shown to be really effective uh, in medicine. Um, but a, a few important cases, uh, one is the analysis of the retinal fundus images uh, for the detection of diabetic retinopathy, but also the analysis of uh, um, skin molds for the detection of uh, uh, skin cancer that has been used by pathologists uh, and, and so on. The idea is that AI is, is great, in particular in the analysis of images. Uh, what we'll see today, how it can be great also in the analysis of long time series, this longitudinal data from wearable sensor, and how we can also explain the diagnosis from, uh, from AI. Let's start um, our journey with, uh, uh, with this work we published in uh, 2020 about resting heart rate. So um, resting heart rate is the heart rate value um, recorded early in the morning be just before you wake up from bed. This is a daily value, so one value per day per individual. And um, it, it tells us about the general state of health of the individual. Let's see, first of all, uh, what is the average uh, daily resting heart rate. So for different individuals, this is the top figure here. Some individuals have a resting heart rate as low as 40 or 50 pulse per minute. Some other may have a resting heart rate as, as high as 90 or more pulse per minute. Most of them are between 60 and 70. So there is a huge variability for the average daily resting heart rate uh, among different individuals. This uh, resting heart rate is also changing uh, with seasons. Um, it reaches a minimum about the end of July, and it reaches a maximum uh, by the end of December, at the end of the Christmas holidays. Even more interestingly, we can look at this resting heart rate for singular individuals. So uh, in the bottom here, we see three individuals. Uh, one on the left has a really constant resting heart rate of about 67 pulse per minute. Uh, the one on the right uh, is a woman in childbearing age. And we see a sort of a periodicity of the resting heart rate over the span of the 12 months. Um, and uh, with a periodicity of about a month. And this is a result of the menstrual cycle and how it influences uh, the value of the resting heart rate. In the center, we see an individual with a resting heart rate of between 65 and 70 pulse per minute, but with a, a really significant spike up to 80 pulse per minute, which lasts for about two weeks. This is really interesting as uh, it is uh, not normal, it's totally unexpected for, for these individuals. 
but uh, it may be a sign uh, potentially of an infectious disease, as we will see uh, in, in a couple of slides. Besides the resting heart rate, we also analyzed uh, sleep, uh, which is another really interesting parameter. So sleep is usually analyzed uh, uh, clinically uh, with a polysomnography exam. As you see from the individual in the picture, the polysomnography exam uh, consists in one night spent at the hospital with all these cables uh, all around the body. This is um, a really deep uh, type of exam, um, really accurate. Uh, but of course, this is uh, just a one night and not a normal night of sleep. On the other side, with wearable sensor, with our population of more than 100,000 individuals, we can measure sleep uh, consistently over different years. We see that the mean sleep duration uh, for this 100,000 individuals is um, anywhere for some individual is less than five hours per night. For some other individuals may be as high as nine hours per night on average. Uh, very interestingly, we can also see that uh, individual by individual, there is a huge um, variability. For some individual, they have a totally disrupted sleep and so they can sleep anywhere between four hours and 11 hours on different days of the week. For other individuals, there is a really regular pattern over the two years that they've been observed. They sleep consistently around, uh, like in this case, uh, on the bottom right, uh, this individual sleep consistently seven hours and a half. We also looked at uh, um, the, a potential correlation between um, the body mass index and the mean sleep duration. And we noticed that uh, people which are, um, who are heavier, so with a higher value of the body mass index, tend to sleep less uh, in duration and tend also to sleep, to have a more disrupted sleep, so more variability between different days. Uh, of their total amount of sleep. All right, so we use this, uh, whatever we learn in this two study on resting heart rate and sleep, really to launch DETECT. DETECT is um, our uh, app-based study uh, for the detection of COVID-19 using uh, wearable data. This is an app-based study. Uh, the app is connecting to the um, uh, to the smartphone. Uh, sorry, it is connected to the uh, to the smartwatch or to the wearable device of the individual. And we uh, we have about thirty-seven thousand participants within the United States uh, in in our detect app. And uh, beside wearable device data, uh, the app is also collecting self-reported symptoms and self-reported test results for COVID-19. Uh, regarding the symptoms, um, in the figure here, we see that there are some symptoms that are really peculiar for people who tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, in particular, we highlight here the decrease in taste of smell, uh, which uh, happens almost uniquely for people who tested positive to uh, COVID-19. and. Uh, I would also like to highlight the uh, website if you are interested in learning more about DETECT. Uh, the website is detectstudy.org. What are the results of this analysis? So we published in, in Nature Medicine uh, last uh, October the first result uh, from, um, uh, from, this, from this cohort of individuals that uh, um, donated their data. We develop uh, different algorithms uh, that uh, one of them uses only wearable sensor data. And uh, it tries to discriminate between positive and negative uh, to a COVID-19 test. It reaches an area under the curve of 072. The area under the curve is a measure of the accuracy. The maximum value here is one. Uh, we, did, we tried uh, a similar algorithm that focused on uh, self-reported symptoms only, and that reaches an area under the curve of 0.71, so very similar. 
And then we try to put the two together. So we develop an algorithm that uses both wearable sensor data and uh, self-reported symptoms. And it reaches a really interesting area under the curve of 0 0.8, so quite accurate. And we think that this can be a great tool, um, not uh, an alternative to uh, a COVID test, but really um, a great tool before a COVID test because we can monitor this individuals and potentially do this uh, initial risk assessment for an individual on a daily basis. All right, uh, the next step here is really the application of a machine learning tool. And this is what we are working on now as we have a larger data set uh, that will allow us to, 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 both, to do both the learning and the testing of the algorithm. About machine learning, uh, well, uh, we saw one, uh, uh, one field in which it can be used, uh, but it can really be used anywhere in medicine. This is an example of machine learning used in cardiovascular care. This is a review uh, we have done in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, um, published just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it really focused on uh, the application of ML techniques in the cardiovascular uh, care space. And we see uh, the central figure here shows us how the, the number of publications uh, involving AI and machine learning in, in cardiology is, is really exploding. It's increasing with, uh, with an exponential growth in the past couple of years. In the uh, interview, we focus really on the different type of learning we can do, the supervised learning with labeled data or the unsupervised learning with, uh, uh, when we have a data set without any label. And but what I would like to focus here is really on the trade-off between accuracy on one side and uh, explainability on the other side. Accuracy, well, um, Machine learning usually have a much higher accuracy than, than other type of, of algorithms. Um, it is able to do, you know, um, to have a, a better precision in, in, in the diagnosis. But this comes really at the price of uh, a low explainability. So usually we have a result, a diagnosis. For example, we can say that, well, this is a skin cancer or this is not a skin cancer but we cannot explain uh, why, we cannot explain how the algorithm made this decision. So um, we try to went deeper into this direction. And this is a specific case uh, of the detection of atrial fibrillation, which is a problem, uh, uh, an irregular rhythm from your heart. We looked here at uh, several uh, deep learning architectures um, to do to accomplish this task, and we chose the best one, and we compare it with um, expert features. So there are two approaches here. Uh, we start with an ECG signal, and uh, we use uh, the, the type of features that a cardiologist would look at. And with these features, we try to detect uh, atrial fibrillation. And on the other side, we use deep learning. So we, we just forget about these features and we let the algorithm learn the features that it considers more important. And we use these features to do the AFib detection. And we see how the deep learning um, approach is, is superior. It reaches a, a better accuracy. This comes at a price. So um, as we see here, the, the input is this single lead ECG, so a signal really like the one you see on, on the left. The signal entered the black box and the black box, um, the machine learning algorithm, outputs one of the four labels, normal sinus rhythm, atrial fibrillation, other arrhythmias, or uh, just noise uh, if the signal is corrupted. This model, as we have seen, uh, comes with a high accuracy but it's really difficult to interpret why it is making a particular decision or which features, uh, which part of the signal is triggering the decision of the machine learning model. So uh, what is the way out? Well, uh, we tried um, and uh, we, we worked 
um, on, on explainability models uh, for, for this specific case. We looked in particular at two types of explanations. On one side, a, a global explanation. So we try to see in general what part of uh, the ECG are used by the black box model to trigger a decision. So we divide really the, uh, the signal uh, between uh, two consecutive peaks of the ECG and try to see in general, so for all individuals, which part of the signal is used by, by the model to trigger a specific decision. On the other side, we looked at local explanation. So we looked at an individual single lead ECG signal, and we try to see which part of the signal are triggering the specific decision for that individual um, ECG. And this, I think, would be uh, a really interesting information that we can return to the, to the cardiologist uh, to better interpret these results. And I would like to conclude um, this talk, uh, really looking at uh, future directions uh, in digital medicine. So we have seen uh, the two main components here, um, uh, at least in my view, of digital medicine. On one side, this personal wearable sensor that allows a passive monitoring of an individual. So without an, any action by the individual, and allows us to collect longitudinal data. So allows us to, to really observe this individual potentially uh, for a lifespan. On the other side, uh, we see artificial intelligence, which is needed for the automatic analysis, automatic and accurate analysis of, of this longitudinal data. Uh, we see it's really accurate, but we see that there is a problem here of low explainability, and there are, we are working towards new techniques to explain how is AI coming to any decision. Both these components will be used for personalized medicine. We will be able, and we are actually uh, more and more able to collect individualized information. So a, a large data set for an individual and we are able to understand what it what is normal for this individual, and we are able to figure out when something is not quite normal and potentially to do an early detection uh, of an illness, um, as uh, as we have done with COVID nineteen. This may come only with a tight collaboration between technologists like sensor engineers. Uh, an AI expert on one side, and on the other side with clinical researchers. And in particular, I think uh, it will be important for, for the three figures to know a little bit about, uh, of, about the fields of the other two uh, for a proper collaboration towards uh, making digital medicine a reality uh, in the future. Uh, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for um, attending.